Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Molly Berenger. I see a lot of new faces. I think that's probably a good thing for this talk. Um, we're supposed to give these talks every year or so, and I decided that uh, this one would be on what I've been working on for the last year, which turns out to have been a fair amount of writing review papers and reviewing things for IPCC and stuff like that. So I'm going to show you a fairly uh, general uh, review of what we know about the marine overturning circulation and heat transport in the ocean. And the, the, the uh, results from that I'm going to show you basically are largely other people's work. And they are compiled in these two major references that I've listed down on the below. On the below. Um, now, because they are reviews, some of them are, ooh, this is not a nice Some of them start from the beginning. So the first paper that I was going to talk to you about to set the stage of overturning circulation was about heat transport. And what I am excited about sharing with you about this particular paper is that uh, we basically recompiled the latest uh, air sea flux estimates to generate some pretty nice, pretty schematics of what you've probably seen in your introductory physical oceanography textbooks like in Gill. So this is an example of one of the figures that we compiled, which just describes the jet, what is currently our best estimate of what the bulk uh, energy balance is in the Earth system. And this is based on the NASA series data that was averaged from 2000 to 2004. And in parentheses, you'll see some values from Trendburst et al., who did another analysis. Um, so, so what you can see from this picture is starting up at the top of the atmosphere. We have incoming solar radiation. That's a fairly well-established number. We call it the solar constant. Uh, of that number, about a quarter of it is reflected automatically by the atmosphere, and about a quarter of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. And then that leaves about half that is actually absorbed by the Earth. Some of that is directly reflected, as well as what's reflected from the atmosphere. So the net incoming solar radiation is around 240 minus 100, around 240, not 340, around 240 watts per meter squared. All of these units are in those, those units. Um, but this is where the uh, interesting fun begins. So the net long, outgoing long wave radiation is around, it's in balance, around 240 watts per meter squared. But this is really where our climate resides, in, in essentially a lot of feedback of long wave and short wave radiation between the ocean and the atmosphere, or light under the atmosphere. <coughs> and then two other components, which, we, which are smaller. Uh, one is the sensible heat, is the, uh, the sensible heat, which is essentially driven largely by the temperature differences between the ocean and the atmosphere today. And then there's the latent heat of evaporation, uh, which also plays a small role. So this is where the action is, um, and this is a general summary of what we think are, is the balance of the Earth's energy system. So let's go to the next slide. So um, <coughs> because of the Earth, so these, these are pictures that you've seen it directly in Gill um, of the net at the top of the atmosphere energy budget. And these have now been updated with these recent data sets. So what's shown here is the, is the uh, Short wave incoming long wave, uh, short wave incoming radiation, this is shown in blue, and the outgoing long wave radiation is shown in red. And this is right at the top of the atmosphere. Um, there's obviously an imbalance between these two. The blue curve is, is weirdly shaped because of the Earth is actually spherical, and so it diminishes at the, at the poles and it's the greatest towards the equator. Whereas the uh, long wave outgoing radiation is very similar, and that's that's because we mix temperature in the ocean and atmosphere and make our planet pretty livable from the equator to pool. But so this imbalance uh, leads to a net uh, heat, trans heat uh, uptake in, in the Earth's system. It includes basically what would be considered continual heating of the tropics and a continual cooling at the poles if you didn't have ocean and atmospheric circulation mix mix mixing things around. So these curves at the top of the atmosphere um, imply that there's ocean and atmospheric heat transport. And that can be shown in the figure down here on the bottom, this is D. Uh, so this is the implied in purple total heat transport. It's around 6 petawatts that goes poleward to redistribute the heat that 
we get at the top of the atmosphere. And that can be um, decomposed to estimate oceanographic heat transport if you do what they call a residual technique. So a lot of atmospheric scientists will tell you what the atmospheric circulation is doing, and they'll give you a good estimate of the atmospheric heat transport. And so the residual is whatever the ocean is doing. And that's this example that's shown here by um, atmospheric scientists. But uh, for, for us oceanographers, there's more to it than that. Um, we like to think that uh, it's not just this incoming uh, outgoing long wave and short wave radiation that's important, but it's actually sort of physical processes that are important. And those are these individual churns that happen largely in the ocean. You have a long wave that shows, uh, this is the short wave, I'm sorry, the blue is the short wave into the ocean now. So these two panels are the ocean pieces of the puzzle. Uh, and, and it shows a similar kind of you know, maximum towards the equator and it attenuates towards the pole. Very, uh, very uh, classic looking. Um, and then that, this is what that difference is. Very, very large. We didn't uh, get to near zero like you would at the top of the atmosphere because we have other processes that are important. And those are the sensible and latent heat fluxes, which are shown down here. Uh, latent heat flux is, is dominant. And it has a particular shape that tends to be symmetrical about the equator. And that's because it's largely latent heat happens where the trade winds are strong. So as the trade winds go over the ocean, they evaporate a lot of water. And therefore, that's where you get the largest latent heat um, released from the ocean. Sensible heat, however, is much smaller. That's that little green curve down in the bottom. But not to say that sensible heat isn't very important. Uh, sensible heat is vital over places like the Gulf Stream, where uh, it's a warm Gulf Stream over a cold atmosphere, and you have a lot of sensible heat loss in the atmosphere here. But on average, it's a fairly small term, and basically only really plays a role towards the polar region. But it does; it is slightly more important over in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. So meanwhile, this is the light blue curve, and I'm sorry that you can't really see it, um, is the net of, of those four components of the ocean surface. And you can see a couple things right away is that this isn't anywhere near zero, uh, because largely a lot of the flux product products are done sort of independently. And they don't actually correct a lot of the consistencies to get a global mean that really makes consistent sense. Um, but it does show there's stronger heat gain in the tropics, and there's more heat loss in the polar regions. And this implies, again, the ocean heat transport. So if you just looked at flux products alone, you would then also generate this kind of ocean heat transport curve. And I might notice that they get, you might notice that they get about two petawatts for the northern hemisphere going northward in all of the ocean basins, and about one in the southern oceans. So those, these are now updated curves. So I, I like them. I, I encourage you to use them. They're, they're new. Anyway. Uh, so you can also, so, so this paper goes into some detail about how ocean heat transport is calculated. And one way I just described to you is the residual method, which is where you basically look at the top of the atmosphere and what the atmosphere itself is doing and estimate what the ocean is doing. Another way that people have, have used is, is to directly integrate surface flux products. They take the net surface heat flux, and this is an example of that, where you've take, uh, taken the net surface heat flux from several products um, that are widely available. Um, and integrated that from essentially the northern hemisphere to the south. And if they were perfectly balanced on net, you would end up with a nice zero at the end. It would be uh, symmetrical. But they're not. They're, they're out of balance by a good bit in all ocean basins globally. Not great. So, and this is because these products are, are essentially, you know, 20 to 2 watts per meter squared, depending upon the product, out of balance globally. So um, the right. So so this is useful uh, because it gives us a, a, a much more integrated view. It's pretty easy. We can use these large-scale uh, derived products. But there's some obviously caveats. Well-known problems within those flux estimates, like in the tropics, are not really corrected. And so you have to tune a uh, flux product like this to the region that you're interested in. So the other advantage for doing something like that and going through the trouble of tuning uh, a, a data set like that would be that you could generate a time series of what the implied ocean heat transport is. So this is an example of that. 
taking the NSAT uh, fluxes, integrated again from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. So the southern hemisphere is not really balanced. And any area, errors that you might get, for example, near the tropics have been propagated into your integral down the southern hemisphere. But it still wants to me, or if you could correct those fluxes, would tell you a lot of interesting things about this, what the forcing is of the oceanic heat transport, the thermal forcing uh, of that heat transport. And this particular sh picture shows you some things that you might like to, to write about. It's like a polar, a, a northward shift slightly through the length of this 1950-2010 record of the latitude where the maximum heat transport is expected to be in the ocean, for example. There are other interesting things that show up in a picture like this, like there is very little gradient of the heat transport expected from the atmosphere in the southern, uh, southern Atlantic. This was done just for the Atlantic Ocean. In some time periods, but in other time periods, there seems to be a big gradient in the expected heat transport. So there's definitely regime shifts that are happening, at least according to these Atlantic hot spots. So this is another reason that you might want to go through the trouble of uh, balancing your air sea hot spots. Um, but the gold standard for doing ocean um, heat transport estimates is obviously direct estimates. That's actually going to see putting out instruments. And those instruments vary. We go into great lengths in this paper about all of the different techniques that have been done and all of the different estimates that have been made. There are a lot. Uh, since this paper was basically an update of what was written in 2000, we decided to concentrate mostly on the, update, uh, the updated heat transport values that have been done since 2000. And we compiled them all for all the various ocean basins, and that's what's shown in this plot. You can't read this plot. Uh, but I wanted to just show you a broad view of what, what, uh, what is interesting about it, which is, one, in the Indian Ocean, which you can't read either, that's this plot here, B, where it goes southward, uh, essentially this heat transport is all poleward, southward, even north of the equator. So while we have a global view that there's poleward uh, transport, and that's all about the equator from looking at flux products, that's not really what's going on in the ocean. And we're most of the oceanographers here, so I think that we're interested in why that is. So it's southward, largely in the Indian Ocean, in the, North, in the Atlantic, it's essentially all northward, southern hemisphere, south Atlantic, all the way to the North Atlantic. You only end up with sort of poleward flow when you combine the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, or when you go global. And so this is the global map, so we'll get to it closer in a second. So I just wanted to show you a broad scale view of that before I showed you more specifically what, what's in these individual plots. Uh, so these are our best estimates right now of what the global heat transport was. It is. Um, what we decided when we were writing this paper is that we would preferentially treat um, products and analyses that were global in nature for a time period so that we could combine them and, and give uh, or, or a product that gave us an error bar uh, were tended to be included in this analysis. It's a pretty exhaustive list, but if yours is not on here, I'm sorry. It, it probably because uh, we didn't provide an error bar. Anyway, so uh, this is what the global heat tra transport looks like. What we've done is taken each of the individual ocean basins and averaged those together. Uh, we came up with an average, which is so shown in this heavy blue line and a standard deviation of all of the different uh, heat transport estimates from all the different ocean bases. That's what's shown in blue. There are still some individual global estimates, mostly from inverses and, and numerical models and reanalysis products. Uh, of note is the purple, which is the new analysis by Lunch and Heimbach. And it's doing a pretty good job. Um, you might note that there's some others, like uh, the Samer and Wunsch, which is this red orange with uh, red black, which is down here. So, so uh, it's not nearly as consistent with the observations as now later uh, reanalysis products are. So we made some progress. Um, I might point out there's another one that's worth mentioning is, is the Zhang and Gifi, which is a soda model. And those are shown in these, uh, this yellow, I mean, blue with black. Them. And so 
Uh, this is the current state of our understanding of the ocean heat transfer. Of note is that we don't get two sphere drift, but two petalops of heat transport globally. We get four like 1.8, I'll say, in the North Atlantic. We don't get one for the South Atlantic, as I would like to. We get more like 0.5 in the South Atlantic, globally. So our, my favorite ocean basin is, of course, the Atlantic, so I spend most of my time talking about that. Uh, that's shown in this, this graph, which just shows you uh, the, the range of uh, details of all of it, the observations that we have. Um, what did I want to tell you about this one? I kind of forgot. So in this, in this ocean basin, we get basically estimates that are, that are high, that are one or more um, for the Atlantic. And again, it's poleward everywhere. And, and in the South Atlantic, it's around 0.4, 0.5. So with, with uh, this, the, these uh, compilation of all these tables in mind, we then did a uh, map of what we think the ocean circulation looks like. And this is based largely on Scanishot and Lynch's uh, global interest that was done in 2000. So it was not part of the last time this, this review paper for this encyclopedia was, was made. Uh, so this provides some new information for that, although it's a fairly old study. Um, the, the numbers on each one of these lines that are written in black are essentially their heat transport estimates. Uh, on here as well is the Cali 2003 estimates, but I'll get to those in a second. But in general, what you should notice is that uh, so these, these blue uh, round circles are essentially the divergence and curve conversions, blue and red, are divergence and conversions of heat into the ocean. So here the heat the ocean is losing a lot of heat, it's going out of the atmosphere, it's cooling the ocean. So you have a lot of North Atlantic cooling, about 1.1 um, petawatts of cooling. And we have some cooling in the North Pacific, but not nearly as much for the width of the ocean basin. You have a lot of tropical Atlantic heating, which if you look at the Indo-Pacific, seems to be far greater than the, the total from the Indo-Pacific relative to the areas that we're talking about. But that's largely because the Indian Ocean essentially has a heat uh, loss to the atmosphere rather than a heat gain. So the Indian, North Indian Ocean is an unusual place. And as you'll see in some of these other results, it's, you know, it's very unusual for other reasons as well. And in the Southern Ocean, we have some cooling, but it, it's, it's sort of 0.7 petawatts instead of the 1.7 petawatts that are happening up in the North Atlantic, uh, North, in the North Atlantic. So again, there is this imbalance. So the paper goes into how we try to understand uh, what these various heat transport values actually are. And for most studies, there's lots of different ways that people try to decompose the circulation so that they understand what the overturning component of the heat transport was versus the gyre component of the heat transport. And those are done various ways, but we decided to just focus on two. Uh, and the first is, is what, we, what we call the uh, it was, is where you break the flow into essentially three, three parts. Uh, a total barotropic component, which is the average velocity and temperature and density across the section. And this is only non-zero if you've decided that there is net flow across the section. So if you think uh, there's flow across uh, the Bering Strait, there's a net barotropic flow. You want to carry that around and care about keeping track of the E minus P fluxes out of the ocean then any given section that you do a transport for will have a net transport component. It'll probably be pretty small, but, but they almost all have to uh, when you take, take those other considerations into effect. So the more common things that you've probably heard of is once this is removed, you can look at what's called the Barrett Clinic component, or some people call this the overturning component, which is where you have uh, products of essentially velocity, which is averaged over depth horizon uh, times its temperature. So this is the, you know, I'll take the North Atlantic as an example. It's warm Gulf Stream uh, flowing northward over the deep western boundary current for these back. So this is this baroclinic component or overturning component of the transport. And then there's a horizontal gyre component of the circulation. And that's where you look at anomalies of the velocity relative to those means uh, and compute those uh, essentially averages together. 
And then there's this other method that we wanted to show because it uh, is uh, slightly more physically based than mathematically based. And this is the method used by Remington Lynch a long time ago and Tally much more recently, where uh, she basically took the um, density level, that is, outcropped, where the zero wind stress curl line, uh, so on the average, is in the ocean basin, and uses that to define basically the upper ocean that's felt in this gyre to air sea fluxes, et cetera, in the gyre. And any net transport in that layer must be subducted. And she argues that it's subducted at the next density layer. So she comes up with a heat transport estimate that's basically a gyre-type heat transport estimate that involves the choosing of the density surfaces and what the transports are in physical layers. Um, what's left over from that is what she calls the deep overturning, or what we're calling the deep overturning circulation. This is essentially a residual between that dire heat transport that she estimates and the total heat transport. So that's what's also shown in this, in this diagram. So it gets to a bit of the mechanism that we think is important for the circulation of heat. Um, those are shown in these blue curves. So I'll show you, this is in the Atlantic, this is our 24 north section. We think that the mean heat transport is about 1.3 kilowatts. This was Ganeshaw's in one estimate, but it was modern observations from the RAPID program. We think that that's a pretty good number. And so where we thought they were good, we left them alone, essentially. Um, but in brackets now is a decomposition of the deep overturning from Tally versus your caustic uh, definition of overturning that you know, Bill Johns might have done for his heat transport people, for example. So those tell you how big the overturning piece of the circulation is, how important that is for generating, uh, for transporting heat. And the yellow, or the uh, light blue curve is this gyre overturning, uh, shallow overturning circulation. And so for 24 North, we, we put these things around the line that are essentially we were talking about. But at 24 north, for example, you can see 1.3 petawatts, somewhere between 0.9 and 1.2 petawatts is responsible for the deep overturning circulation. So a majority of the heat transport at this latitude and this location is driven by this deep penetrating overturning circulation in the Atlantic. And there isn't very much that's due to gyre recirculation. Uh, in the South Atlantic, uh, the Generally, the circulations are the exact opposite for the gyre. They tend to go southward because you have warm western, western boundary currents carrying warm water, and they're being cooled south of there, these divergent areas, and being returned back southward. That's true for the South Atlantic and for the Indian Ocean, where the, the uh, gyre components are negative. Well, yeah. yeah. I know about the Pacific. Uh, the uh, yes, the, the, the net heat transport is northward, and the gyre circulation transport is also northward. And, and if, you, if you look at it, this is the only basin where north of, of the gyre circulation, you actually have net heat into the ocean from the atmosphere. Whereas all of the other subtropical gyres, you have heating, you know, as the flow is heading towards the western boundary, heading north on the western boundary, and then cooling as it, as it recirculates southward. But the Pacific is actually exactly the opposite. It actually gains heat as it transits across the Pacific. So that makes the South Pacific an interesting space. Um, the, generally, the magnitude of these things is also quite, kind of small. Uh, the overturning circulation up in the it's in the 0.3 petawatt range on almost all ocean basins, except for uh, the Indian Ocean, which is it's minus 0.7, minus 0.6. Uh, and the overturning circulation is also quite quite high here. So there's a lot of interesting things going on in the Indian Ocean, but strong southward flow of heat in the Indian Ocean. Uh, up in the far north Atlantic, uh, at North Pacific, they, uh, the overturning gyre is responsible for a majority of the net transport. It's 0.5 terawatts, and it's responsible for about 0.3 terawatts. 
So anyway, so that's a general summary of what we think we know. And uh, this kind of decomposition helps us to try to understand what the role of wind forcing is relative to the thermohaline circulation, the heat overturning circulation. So now to um, time period. So the paper will go into a lot of detail about all of the different observing systems that there are. But with recent work done by the rapid teams, et cetera, we, are, we now appreciate how very important it is to have time periods of heat transport observations. So these are some of the tra transport times, longest transport time periods in the ocean that I know about, um, that, so that we put them in place. The top one is the 41 north uh, heat transport. That's all of the direct observations are shown in black in each panel. Um, in gray, behind that is either a, a, a non-low pass filter, is usually a non-low pass filter version of that data. This is monthly data. It's got a three, three month low pass filter applied to it. Same with this. Um, this uh, has a much longer, I think it has an annual low pass filter to it, just so that you can see it relative to this uh, zigzag. Anyway, so this is the 41 North data, which was done by Hobbs and Willis. Willis did an estimate of the meridional overturning circulation at 41 North using Argo and altimetry data. Uh, and Hobbs then later came along and converted that into a heat transport value. So we have basically heat transport estimates up at 41 degrees north from about 19, 2002, when the Argo program was really fully implemented. Uh, in this middle panel, we have the RAPID program. And that the heat transport uh, estimate was shown here, was done by John at all in 2011. It's now been extended by him, so the original time period is actually only this first one piece. Um, and then down at 30 to 35 south, we have the XPT program. So we have extendable bacchia thermographs that go from Cape Town to Buenos Aires. And those have been used to estimate the radial overturning circulation and heat transport using only really shallow XPT. Uh, but but since it's a time series, one of the few time series that we have, um, I think it also applies here. So uh, the other things that are shown on this curve are how well we're doing with the various models, reanalysis models. This is the soda model, and in blue is the ECHO model, the launch and the uh, time back model that I was talking about before. So what you can see is that there's a lot of variability in the heat transport. That's the first thing that jumps out at you. It shows you these nice pretty global map where it looks like if we do everything quite simply, it's 1.3 petawatts, it's 26 north. But it's not. It's, it's sometimes uh, two and a half petawatts and sometimes it's no petawatts. So the variability is quite large at all latitudes. Um, this is probably the best array and it probably has the, the largest overall amplitude of this uh, scatter um, in terms of it's actually measuring all the components, whereas the Argo program doesn't really has a smoother estimate of what the various components are. Because it's basically a monthly time period. So yeah, so all show that there's so uh, all all the things that aren't shown here are also that say there's a strong uh, dependence on heat transport with the MOC. All of these studies showed around 0.05 petawatts of change in heat transport for every one period of change in the overturning circulation. So this alone shows you the importance of of actually measuring the MOC because you can get much higher accuracies of your heat transport estimates. If you can measure the MOC to one third if you're suddenly getting a heat transport estimate that's uh, much more accurate than you might have otherwise. Okay. So, um, so where are we doing well? Um, basically the, uh, the only models that really do a somewhat decent job is the SOTA model does pretty well down in the South Atlantic. Um, the, both the ECHO and the SOTA models are too low relative to what we see at 26 North. And the yeah, ECHO model does better, but neither model really is capturing the variability up at 41 North. So we have, still have a lot of uh, work that needs to be done. And um, even with these long time series, we're seeing, starting to see lots of annual cycle variability, interannual variability but not a very substantial trend. Now, at least it's been, as, as far as these time periods go, none of the authors report a significant trend in the heat transport time period. So 
So that, that's sort of the summary of that first paper. And so and it was a bit of an introduction to why we care about measuring that meridional overturning circulation. So we had an uh, international conference that was involving the US Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Science Team and the United Kingdom uh, Science Team. And out of that um, um, meeting, we decided to have a summary review document that was published in BAM to sort of describe what we thought the state of the ocean, uh, a state of the knowledge of the marine overturning circulation was, and what the remaining questions were moving forward. So this is a so this is an example. Uh, this is a little schematic since I didn't really show it to you earlier of what the overturning circulation actually looks like, at least in the North Atlantic. Um, the red curves are surface water and they transform into other colors, like yellow and then later blue, as they become cooler in the north, far north Atlantic, eventually being deep currents that return southward as blue currents. Very generic in that. And this shows the approximate location of the 26th century. So, um, we, uh, so in, that, in this particular paper, we went through a lot of um, uh, the recent state of knowledge of understanding the MOC variability in terms of not just direct observations, but also proxies and climate models. Uh, in the end, we decided to use this schematic that was generated from looking at climate anomalies that were determined basically from paleo proxies. This particular paper came from uh, Ellie and Augusta Daughter. Um, and it was associated with the uh, determining from lost proxy data the impact of this um, HK uh, event, which happened in the Holocene around 800 years ago. Um, this was before the Younger Dryas from the Little Ice Age and stuff like that. And it was thought to essentially be a flooding of, of uh, meltwater that had been accumulating up in the Canadian archipelago that flush into the North Atlantic, uh, like climate models do for their hosing experiments. So they take lots of fresh water and dump it on the top of the uh, ocean. So this was actually observed in the past, and in proxy data, they, they tried to reconstruct what the impact of that was. And this is what they basically found, is that the, the fresh water essentially slowed down the meridional overturn system, this is an AMOC, and that led to cooling overall of the North Atlantic. Uh, a southward shift to where deep water was formed. So instead of being formed up in the Nordic Seas, a large portion of it anyway being formed up in the Nordic Seas, it was all now formed south of Iceland. And that led to essentially dry continental climates and cold weather around the Atlantic Basin as well. And some changes in the wind pattern as well. So we chose this schematic because uh, the more recent work that has been done with hosing experiments tends to show pretty much exactly the same kind of uh, result. Uh, and other studies uh, that uh, also looked at couple climate models, long-term runs, and look for um, MOC anomalies and what their relative impacts are as well. So this seems to hold together while it was put together from a paleo proxy data set. It seems to be a fairly consistent uh, view of what we think of the current impacts of flowing of the MOC. Um, so then what is the MOC? So I showed you the heat transport estimate that John did uh, from, from the uh, local rapid data. Um, the MOC transport is shown here. Uh, this paper uh, summarizes some of the great things that have happened in the first four years that we had this data. Uh, and it gives us a hint about some of the new work that's being done. And then the first four years of this of this uh, fully trans-basin array, take a sense of moorings across the Atlantic, we learned that doing this kind of sparse array actually works. Um, there are several papers about that. Um, we have now a mean and standard deviation of what the MOC transport is based on actual data. Uh, we know something about what the peak-to-peak -peak variability is of the seasonal cycle of the MOC from this data. Uh, we've started to understand a little bit more about the physics um, what drives that seasonal cycle. At least for the first four years of the record, it appeared that the seasonal cycle was really dominated by uh, the upper ocean thermocline variability. It wasn't the Eklund transport, it wasn't the Gulf Stream transport, 
although this can play a role, it really was driven by largely the upper ocean of thermal structure. And that was largely, in turn, forced by what we think is the wind stress curl uh, on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean. We're starting to understand uh, some of the um, physics that are actually happening that control the MOC variability. And now that we have beyond four years of data, which is what's shown in here, we had even more surprises. So this is a huge uh, low MOC anomaly that we saw in the winter of 2009-2010. Uh, and since then, there have been a couple of papers about, that well, wasn't before, about uh, what's the cause of that. And it turns out that that's probably something slightly different than what we thought was really driving a seasonal anomaly. That's the transport. Um, but it's not the only one. There are others. So we had the, I showed you the heat transport estimates that people have made uh, from the 41 North Array using the Argo data. That originated from an MOC estimate from Willis, who used Argo and, and altimetry. And that's what's shown here on this black line next to the rapid MOCA low-pass filter version of that time period that I just showed. So they have different means because the time series over which I've computed them here are totally different. Um, but uh, uh, so it shows you that we're not yet done. So there's a lot of area variability and the time series is not stable. Um, so we have those two time series. And then we also have another one, which I didn't show you because I haven't computed in heat transport, is at 16 north. Uh, so at 16 north, the Big Ten and others are, are instrumenting the lower layer of the MOC across the Atlantic basin. And that's why in this picture it looks so weird. This is a, the upper limb is this, what we think of as the upper MOC. We, we describe it as a positive number, but these things, these, these things are essentially computed throughout the water column. But for the Ube Sen work, they aren't. They are instrumented only below a certain depth. And so they're really only getting the, the lower transport, uh, export of deep water out of the Atlantic. We're not getting that surface inflow. That's why the signs are different. You might, we have debates about whether or not we should flip the, right, the, the uh, transport up or down. Anyway, so, so this uh, picture also appears in that article. Um, it also appeared in an earlier, I was getting ready for a BAMS article, and that's why I pulled this particular one out for you. Um, these time series are now being updated annually in a BAMS State of the Climate report. So if you want to see what we think the latest trend of the MOC is for any of these time series, I recommend that you go to the BAM uh, report, because uh, these will be continue to be updated. But so we, we now know a couple things uh, about these, these time series. They, they have uh, strong annual cycles at, at all three latitudes, but they have phase shifts associated with them. Um, the the uh, 41 north is, seems to be in phase with the 16 north, and 90 degrees out of phase with the MOC at 26 north. Uh, we now think that that's probably due to the large-scale wind stress curl field in the, in the north of land. No, no, no real big surprise. And essentially, a similar mechanism for determining the seasonal cycle at 26 north. Uh, we've also started to look at trends of these various time series. For example, an MOC from this exact time series, we decided that there was no significant trend in the, the MOC from this particular short time series. Um, there was some interesting changes. The interior transport was decreasing function of time, and the echo transport was increasing. But together, these sort of canceled out and led to no real significant trend. At, at 26 north, um, at, at 16 north, I'm sorry, they, they have a suggestion of a southward transport, a decreased southward transport, which is actually a, also would be considered a decrease of the MOC. There's less flow going southward, that's less of the return flow, and has less of a MOC. So that's that. So then there, the, the paper also goes into a lot of details about what we think the current impacts are of MOC variability. And this is one example taken from a hosing experiment done with it using the HAD uh, CM3 model. Um, what they did is they imposed 
six salt flux workers in Far North Atlantic and looked for the response. On this side is the control run, and this is the hosing after the MOC has been shut down. What's plotted here is actually the standard deviation of sea height anomaly. So it's essentially a proxy for what they think the storm surge is. So think of this as the storminess map on average. So pre-hosing experiment versus post-hosing experiment, you can see that there's a shift slightly northward of the storm track and a strong intensification, especially into the on these on this uh, thing. Um, there's a long list, if you read this paper, of potential in impacts from the MOC. Uh, and those include basically what would cause those storm track changes, reduced SSTs and surface air temperatures. Uh, the MOC is directly related to heat transport, so it would it falls only naturally that it would have an impact directly on the sea surface temperature and air temperature. Oops. Um, so there's basically a cooling of the North Atlantic and adjacent lands that I already showed you in that other plot. There's a thought that there's a reduction of the uh, AMO associated with the MOC decrease. The strengthening of the winter storms and their track changes, which I also just showed you. There's an associated increase of westerlies and a decrease of easterly trade winds also associated with the changes of the MOC. There's a southward movement of the ITC and associated pre precipitation changes, changes in drought, changes in precipitation in monsoon regions. The rising of North Atlantic sea level around the periphery of the basin due to just kinematic effects of changing the circulation of the MOC. And then there's changes in, uh, but also due to, of course, cooling of the temperatures. So then there's changes in the circulation in general that have been seen before, for example, on the subpolar ocean, the Heineken lines, for example, also associated with sea level change. And then there's uh, some preliminary work has been done at looking at uh, the effect of uh, the MOC on the carbon cycle. Uh, the only paper that we could really find was a carbon export production paper, which was really about nutrient flux uh, and how it was associated with the de a decrease of that was associated with a decrease of the MOC. And then there's some work that's been done recently on land biochemistry that basically has a lot to do with the changes in the ITCZ that leads to a reduction in net primary production on land due to cooling and decreased precipitation. Again, that map that I showed you of the overall impact that we saw from paleo data showed cooling of the Atlantic, cooling of the continental coastal areas, plus drying of the coastal areas. So that's another impact. Um, so where are we now today? Um, this isn't quite today, but it's close enough. Um, the, uh, what's going to appear probably in the IPCC by AR5 assessment is this figure which shows um, essentially a consensus of the community that there is no significant trend in the ranks of the MOC over this time period. And that's in part because the Gulf Stream, mine at all, shows essentially no change. This is the extended time period through 2012 uh, of the, this extremely long proxy, you hope, for the strength of the MOC. Um, and, and in the various other components, the RAPID program and the ARGO, the uh, 41 North program with Josh Willis, show a slight decrease. Um, but with the errors so large and the annual cycle so large, uh, while technically this, this was um, outside the 95% confidence limit, we were not particularly confident in saying that this was a substantiated decrease in the MOC. In part, for example, like at the time, in part because we have large events that would happen, like this large anomaly of low MOC variability in the winter of 2009-2010. So our, our feeling at the time of, of preparing for this ICC report was that we still couldn't say definitively. The other reason was, of course, that the MOC um, for the South Atlantic had, for, for the 16 North, has a slightly increasing uh, southward transport. So the transport of the MOC in the deep layer at 16 North increasing 
So an increasing deep export means a higher MOC value. So while theirs is also not really significant at all, given the huge variability that the time series has, um, and I should say that these were all computed over the same exact time periods, which is shown in these red bars. Um, so that's where we decided. That we decided that there basically was no convincing trend uh, from the direct observation. Uh, since that time, we now have more data. And um, um, uh, we have another paper coming out, or being submitted shortly, uh, about uh, looking at the MOC trend from the rapid data. And that shows a much smaller decrease than what's calculated here. It's about five uh, servers per decade. Uh, but it has a much lower error bar because we have more data and more samples that the degrees of freedom over time series. So we'll eventually be able to probably confirm that the MSC is decreasing, I believe, um, with more time series. So uh, just because I pointed out to you, I'm essentially done with the talk, but because I pointed out to you this anomalous event that happened in December uh, 2009, in, in, 2000, in the winter of 2009, 2010, um, I thought I would just show you the paper that basically goes into that a little bit more. It's by Gerard McCarthy, and it got published last fall, 2002. Uh, these are the time periods of various components of the MOC. And the MOC is this blue curve right here. And so what we're talking about is this thing. This is an annual average of the MOC for that for the April to April time period centered around that event. So that you're basically including all of the winter time periods. Uh, so obviously this was way below the average standard deviation of the annual means for the other years. And we wanted to look into what was causing that. Uh, from looking at this diagram, you can see well, the Gulf Stream part, which is this awful green curve, up top, is generally low. Um, this MOC transfer anomaly is probably about five and a half seven. Uh, the low Gulf Stream transport in this time period accounts for maybe one of those. Um, and then there's also a strong um, uh, transport anomaly associated with exon transport. It's weak exon transport. It actually reverses during part of the time period. It's being lost to the software. Um, but overall, this is about one and a half of the net change in the MOC. And while you can't really tell here, this is the upper ocean um, circulation, which is going southward. And so perhaps it would be easier to look at this. So in order to basically isolate the impact of the upper ocean on the, uh, this anomalous event versus the equine transport, what Gerard did is he took the data that we had and used uh, the annual mean seasonal climatology of the equine transport and held that fixed so that we were basically recomputing what the MOC looks like without having the anomalous equine event in the time why this is important is because hidden in the way that we do the calculation to get the interior transport, we do a mass adjustment. Gulf Stream transport head north, got 32 surgrips. That has to go back southward. And, and we use the interior transport reference level to basically adjust that. We do the same thing for the ethnic transport. So we wanted to remove the influence of an anomalous assessment event uh, to try to isolate what was happening with the what, what, what part of the ocean we were actually measuring, like what the ticket fence in the interior of the Atlantic measures. So that's what's shown here. So the MOC is the curve that's in red, and that purple curve is the upper mid-ocean transport. And you can see once we've removed these effects, we don't even have to show the Gulf Stream transport, which was low in general. But you can see that this is largely explained by the upper mid-ocean. And the other interesting thing that came out of this analysis is that not only do we have this really interesting event going on that seems to be this big thermocline event happening, uh, but also in the deep ocean there's a lot of strange things happening. It's basically this increase of lower North Atlantic deep water um, associated with the event. So the upper North Atlantic deep water doesn't really change very much. Um, and the interesting thing is from historical observations that this at Abaco, the Deep Ocean Boundary Current, Bill Current, you know, these other things for years and years and years, have suggested that the flow below a thousand meters is actually fairly barotropic. We, we keep thinking of these things as behaving together. But for the first time, we've seen this, where they clearly there's a huge shear that's happening between these layers. Uh, 
the, the demarcation between these two layers, I should just say, is 3,000 meters. So the upper is uh, 1,100 to 3,000 meters, and the other is 3,000 down and above. So what is causing this upper mid-ocean transport event besides this, obviously, component that is the deep circulation, but it's a shear thing, right? Um, there's also the thermocline depth. This is the thermocline depth that basically is taken in the western side of the basin. So unlike, so it shows extremely high correlation with the upper mid-ocean um, transport, especially during this event, for example, right here. So this is showing that at longer time scale, so we already talked about uh, the seasonal variability we think we've decided has, is due to some short-term uh, wind stress curl that's dominated by the eastern boundary over longer time scales and maybe not so long time scales, interannual uh, episodic events, that it's really the thermocline depth in the western part of the basin that actually is. So we're learning new things about this, uh, this array, uh, the more data that we get. Uh, this event happened again the next year. And so we're in the process of trying to figure out what's, what's going on with that. It was a, even a slightly different character to, to that event as well. So the summary of the array is that ooh, close up. Um, we now know that you know, the mean transport overall was about 17.1, but it was much higher for the first four years. Now it's much lower. So we're now gaining confidence that we really are seeing a trend. And it's not necessarily just these two driven by these two uh, strong winter times. Low MSC events. So then the reductions in SP transport. So yeah, I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, let's see. So then the Murray LMP transport also shows a similar decline from about 1.3 to about 1.1. So the new result of all of this is that, that we seem to be you know, confirming that there really is a decrease in MOC and MSC Murray LMP transport. And uh, this is going to be at least a uh, MOC part is going to be submitted by SNEED, uh, is submitted already to SNEED, uh, to Ocean Sciences. I think it's actually online now. You can look at it in the discussion session. Uh, all this data is available for the rapid milk program. The other two uh, data sets, you actually have to ask for them, but they are readily available uh, that I showed you, 41 North and 16 North. So overall, the paper goes into what we think the outstanding questions are uh, for the future of MOC research. And that centers around things like the connectivity of the MOC. Uh, it's very, very clear that we need more observations. In particular, we need observations up in the polar Atlantic and, and in the <coughs> subtropical South Atlantic. We now have a pretty good number in the top, you know, subtropical Atlantic, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're missing those two important pieces where people have suggested that there might be boundaries to the connectivity, either at the equator or uh, north. Around, around 41 months. Um, and the other is MOC proxies. Can we make proxies or indicators or understand more about the impacts of this MOC variability? I showed you just one paper per, per, per impact that I showed earlier. We need, we need more, more convincing evidence from a variety of models and analysis. And we need to understand more about the mechanisms of the natural variability. Just these time series alone have changed our view of, of understanding the mechanisms of the MOC transport from 26 North. Uh, we need more of that. Um, understanding the ocean response to changes in forcing is important in order for us to develop a predictive capability. Uh, we need to be able to predict the MOC by improving, initializing, and evaluating models against real data. So those will be real areas of improvement in the next few years. Uh, we need to understand more about the, goal, the MOC's role in the global carbon cycle and the terrestrial biosphere uh, because those are where our real impacts are likely to come. Um, does the MOC variability constrain the CO2 uptake, for example? And that how will it change in the future? Is, is the AMOC stable or, or is it bi-stable? Um, those, are, those are questions that have been posed by a fairly simple um, couple of models. Um, and certainly just deserve further research. For heat transport, uh, we had some summaries of, uh, from that paper as well about what we thought the, the uh, way forward was. Um, in particular, because you compile all of this data, you can pretty clearly see where specific regions were, that were, weren't particularly measured. For example, the tropical oceans is just one example. 
uh, for example, in the Atlantic, we have only one heat transport estimate between 24 south and the equator. Only one. Uh, then there's the influence in general of the western boundary current and MOC variability on the marine heat transport. Uh, most of the Atlantic shows this big, big deep overturn circulation but uh, as driving it, but that's not necessarily true for any of the ocean basins. So we need to understand those mechanisms better. Then there's seasonal variability, what drives them, what changes them from one latitude to the other, things like that. What are the role of eddies, particularly in the southern ocean? You have to transport heat across all those thermal, the, the, the thermal gradients in the southern ocean. And of course, the goal of terrains and things like that. What, what is the role of those playing on the heat transport? And there's individual true flow variability, uh, unresolved circulation issues, like, for example, the deep inflow into the Indian Ocean, and those huge uh, alpha uh, heat transport estimates that come from the Indian Ocean. And then again, there's model evaluation and validation of mechanisms of trends. So the summary, uh, the, these were review, um, and they are available. Uh, the, I just got the page proof back today for the heat transport paper. We should be able to put that up online on our website pretty soon. But this is available um, because it's been recorded, and it will be uh, posted on our PHV website, not only the recording, but the actual slides for the presentation. Uh, and you should be able to go to the PHRD homepage and look through our references and download the documents if you're interested in, in reading more. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. It is. It is the only basin that transports heat northward. The, uh, heat transport in the Indian Ocean is southward. But in the Pacific, oh, so in the Pacific, it's near zero in the in the south of okay. South Pacific. But it is north. Yeah. So, so no, our current thinking now is that it's not the only basin. Um, more questions? Let's see if I can Are there questions on the phone? Marlos. Did you, did you do a, uh, one estimate of the direction of the train, given the, the noise, like how, how, how much, like, for example, a time to how much yeah. should be for you to be yeah. uh, No. I did not do a calculation like that, but it has been done several times. Joanna Bear, Yaka Moratsky, they have several papers that talk about that. Uh, and using the kind of statistics that they think is true for the 26th North Array, I think they come up with something like 30 years before they think it's really going to be a detectable trend that, that you would expect from a climate, a 30% decrease like you expect from a climate model. Well, thank you guys all for coming.